And I always say, I'm pro-choice and people look at me as if I have two heads. And I said, but I know the better choice is life. So I do believe that a woman has a right to choose, but I also believe she has the right to all of the information. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast, where I interview major thought leaders from various fields of influence, showing how our worldview changes everything. You can find the show everywhere you can find podcasts. Would you consider leaving a review on your favorite platform if you enjoy the discussions? That helps more people find out about it. Just that moment or two from you makes a real difference. And we'd love for more people to learn about the show. My guest today is Robin Chambers, Vice President of Advocacy for Children at Focus on the Family. In addition to working with a variety of pro-life organizations, Robin runs Option Ultrasound, a program that provides ultrasound machines and training to qualified pro-life medical clinics in high abortion communities. Robin has worked for Focus on the Family for over 25 years, providing leadership and quality content for the pro-life cause. She lives with her husband in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Please welcome Robin to the show. Robin Chambers, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. This is fun to have you here in person. You are the vice president at Focus on the Family for Advocacy for Children. That's correct. And it's a long title. And I said my favorite title is actually Grammy. So, <laughs> but I'll answer to anything. I, I love that. Well, t- <laughs> tell me just uh, briefly what you do in that role, because what we're going to talk about today is so important to the kind of audience that we have. They're passionately interested in pro-life causes, but deeply concerned about the direction our culture is going on that. Um, One of the things that I think is really important to remember is pro-life is very broadly defined at times. You know, there's nine to 10 different topics that you could talk about when you're talking about pro-life. But for what I do at Focus on the Family is four specific buckets um, two of the biggest that I really spend the majority of my time on is abortion and preborn. Um, and yes, they go hand in hand, unfortunately. And you know that in our culture, um, abortion has become very um, easily to easy accessible. And so spend a lot of time in that working with pregnancy centers across the United States. Um, something we started about 20 years ago is this little thing called option ultrasound. But that really changed the, I, I think, changed the face of pregnancy centers. They now offer ultrasound services for free for women who find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy. That's true healthcare, not what the other side says is healthcare. And my other hat that I wear is foster care and adoption, and I'm super passionate about that. Custody of my grandchildren when they were three and four and went through the foster care system for kinship adoption. So that's what I do the majority of my time. And then interwoven in that is elder care and special needs. Uh, That's quite a portfolio. There's a lot to do in all of those things. So uh, I'm not even sure exactly where to begin to, to break all of that down, but I, I'd love to, I'd love to f- follow up on one thing you mentioned about ultrasounds. The, so I know what an ultrasound is and I know how it works and I've, I've seen ultrasounds of, of my own children. What it, I, I wouldn't have thought of that as being something that focus on the family does. I think of focus on the family. I think of a, a radio broadcast that comes out every day. I think of adventures in Odyssey. Absolutely. <laughs> I think of you know, really great people who work there and very passionate about what they do. But that's a little bit of a curveball. What is it a, about ultrasound that, that focus on the family felt like we have got to be in, involved and engaged in this? Great question. I would say... For the entirety of Focus on the Family, we're going close to 50 years. We'll celebrate our 50-year anniversary in a couple of years. It is always pro-life, sanctity of human life, value and dignity of human life has always been a part of our DNA. That was something that Dr. Dobson talked about um, faithfully on the radio for many, many years. And so we had this little teeny tiny department called Sanctity of Human Life Department. And what we did at that time was we created booklets that were used in counseling sessions in a pregnancy center. And then 20 years ago, so we're celebrating 20 years of option ultrasound this month, but 20 years ago, we saw a significant rise in the number of abortions, enough to have everyone at focus go, whoa, whoa, what's going on in the culture? 
Why is this happening? And what can Focus on the Family do to really intersect um, and possibly even help change the direction of a woman who's making an abortion decision? And so someone much smarter than I, you and I both know her, Yvette Marr, said it's ultrasound. When you see the picture of a baby on ultrasound, you kind of lose the argument of that's just a clump of tissue or it's just cells, which 20 years ago was the argument. And that started a very, very fast moving um, idea that Yvette had and took it to the leadership. And they said, absolutely, this is a way that Focus on the Family could serve. Um, that really is a part of our DNA as well as, you know, what can we do to serve others? How can we equip others to get involved in cultural issues. And so we started talking and planning and praying and dreaming. And Option Ultrasound um, came about in January 2004. And our very first machine went into a little tiny town in uh, Iowa, Clinton, Iowa. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What is involved in getting an ultrasound machine? It's a piece of medical equipment. I wonder, is it very expensive to do? Is it difficult to operate? Um, I would say no and no, and here's why. So we started working with another organization. Um, that's something that we do well is we look for others who are like-minded um, and align with our belief system, and we work with an organization that helps us buy ultrasounds in bulk. I know that sounds – it's not Sam's. We don't go to Sam's and get paper <laughs> towels. Um, but we really look at one organization who can do – kind of have that buying power. Um, most of the machines that we place are about $25,000. Uh, we are 100% – donor funded. And we have some of the most amazing donors who have caught that vision 20 years ago to say ultrasound can make a difference in a woman choosing life. Um, and we have a very stringent, I will say, we've had we've heard that word, um, process to get that. But what we do when we're looking at pregnancy centers is making sure that everything is in place to provide medical care with excellence. They have nurses on staff, right. physician oversees everything that happens in that center. And so we're pretty picky about what happens. But it's for it really is for the health and the benefit of that center, but it's also to serve that woman. She deserves our excellent care. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we call these centers pregnancy resource centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They used to be called crisis pregnancy centers, Correct. I think. Mm -hmm. what, uh, I'm curious, what, what was that shift, by the way? Why? Great question. And probably for the 50 years that pregnancy center work has been going on, um, that term crisis pregnancy was used very... Um, widely, I think. And we had several, believe it or not, several post-abortive women who came to Christ and went through hope and healing at a pregnancy center. And they said, you need to stop using the word crisis because then you're adding to um, that anxiety that that woman already feels. Can we say unplanned or can we say unexpected? It's not unplanned by God, certainly unexpected by that woman. Um, so we changed. Um, focus really led out in that probably about 15 years ago to say, let's move away from that and use a term that feels less um, scary, mm -hmm. maybe. And yes, it is a crisis, and we're not denying that fact, but we're saying it's not unplanned by God, it's unexpected by you. And here's some resources for you okay. to walk you through that journey. Yeah. Good distinction. Mm -hmm. My progressive friends say about these centers that this is just a sneaky way to keep women under control, make them feel guilty about having an abortion and to, to force them to have their babies. They can't have control over their own lives. That's, that's what I hear from them. So obviously they're not a fan of these kinds of centers. I'd love for you to just share a little bit. I'm sure you've run into that challenge when you go into different communities. Yes. Uh, how do you respond? I always say, first and foremost, come visit. Hmm. If you really want to know what goes on in a pregnancy center, pregnancy resource center, pregnancy medical center, whatever you want to call it, um, come and see what happens. Because the, the men and the women that work in those centers don't have an agenda they're there to serve that woman when she comes in. And interestingly enough, and this is something that I don't think many people understand, they actually talk to her about abortion because they know that is one of her choices. You've seen what's happened since the overturn of Roe. Abortion has become very accessible. In fact, Colorado is an abortion destination state. You can have an abortion through 40 weeks in Colorado. Wow. It's a full-term baby. When a woman goes into the pregnancy center, everything they do, they ask permission first because she needs to know that she's back in control. And they will say, is it all right if we take some information from you? 
Is it all right with you if we do a pregnancy test? Would you like to have an ultrasound? They do nothing without her permission. Mm -hmm. She's the one in control. She's the one saying, yes, I want this. Can you help me with this decision? I don't think women make a flippant decision for abortion. I think it's a heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching decision when she makes an abortion decision. So when she goes in, they don't immediately say, you need Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Is that part of their conversation when it's available? Absolutely. But they talk to her about what does it mean to carry this baby to term and parent and hear the resources for you? What does it mean to carry this baby to term and make an adoption plan and we'll walk that journey with you? What does it mean to make an abortion decision? Here's what happens. And we want you to come back. The number of women who come back after an abortion in a pregnancy center actually astonishes me. They'll come back for hope and healing. They need the redemption that only Christ can offer. That's after she's made a decision. There is no coercion. She's in control. Mm -hmm. The picture you're, that you're, you're painting here is this is not judgmental. It's supportive. Uh, a woman who comes in who's in an unexpected pregnancy, maybe an unwanted pregnancy, has agency. She's the one who is going to ultimately have to make the decision. But she's able to get information that she might not have any other, any other way. That's correct. And pregnancy centers do not make any money off of a decision that she makes. All of their services are free and they're confidential. They never share her information. Even if the father of the baby comes in, he doesn't come into the room without her permission. Maybe mom and dad are with her. They don't come into the room without her permission. She is in control because everything feels out of control mm -hmm. when you're in that situation. So putting her back in control lets her know that things are okay. Take a breath. Mm -hmm. Take a breath. Let's talk through all your options. I think one of the things that pregnancy centers do that very few people understand is they have resources right in her community to say, you need housing? Look, here's your housing. You need child care? Here's child care. She yeah. has no idea that these resources are even available to her, and the pregnancy center offers all of that at no charge. Wow. That's really that's really incredible. I, I, had, I heard a statistic... And I saw a couple of studies about this, but it's been a long time since I looked at them. But the, the statistic was that it's up to 75% of women who get an abortion say they felt pressured to do so by somebody significant in their life. The, uh, uh, the father of the baby, a mom, you know, saying this is going to ruin your life if you have a baby, just, you know, get this behind you and, and move on. If you... Have you heard that or have you found... I've actually found read the journal. There's a physician who wrote a, uh, a published paper in... Um, it's called the Physician's Journal. And so everything that goes in there is um, credible. It has been verified by other physicians. And in that study... They actually said 74.8% of all women who are post-abortive said they felt extreme pressure to abort. Yeah. And it was father of the baby. Sometimes it's not necessarily a boyfriend. It could have been someone that was just a weekend um, activity. Um, it could be mom or dad or even someone else in their life who says, this will ruin your life. You need to do this. And what was even more concerning is the amount of at-risk behavior that that woman then engages in because of the guilt and the shame. Sure. Christ never called us to a lifestyle of guilt and shame. She just doesn't know that there's hope and healing and where to find that. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important because we, we hear in our culture a lot of talk about a woman's right to choose. But the reality in the actual Pregnancy Resource Center is these women are under a significant amount of cultural pressure if you have this baby, I will leave you. If you have this baby, you're kicked out of our house or, or, or whatever. That doesn't sound like a right to choose to me. That sounds like coercion. I agree. And I always say I'm pro-choice and people look at me as if I have two heads. And I said, but I know the better choice is life. So I do believe that a woman has a right to choose, but I also believe she has the right to all of the information. When you go into an abortion provider, they are there for one choice. They are there to end the life of that child. They're there to help that woman choose to end the life of her child. Pregnancy centers talk about all three choices. So what's the better way to serve a young woman? She has the right to all of the information. She has the right to empowerment that comes from that information and that education. And I think with the resources and even one person saying, congratulations, I'll go through that pregnancy with you, I think she'll choose life. We hear that anecdotally, eight out of 10 post-abortive women will say, 
just one person. And it didn't even have to be father of the baby. It could be a girlfriend, a pastor, uh, a boss, mm. a coworker, to say to her, congratulations, you're pregnant. I'll go through this pregnancy with you. I think women deserve that information and not just one piece of information to make a decision. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense. You mentioned the state of Colorado and, and the laws here that are now permitting abortion through the entire pregnancy. Correct. So up to the state of Colorado permits abortion for any reason or for no reason up to the moment of birth. Is, am I getting that? That's correct. There's absolutely no restriction in Colorado right now. There's not even uh, what we call uh, woman's right to know, which is ultrasound. Mm -hmm. She has to have an ultrasound before she can make an abortion decision. Several states have that. And there's also parental notification. Parental notification has been lifted in the state of Colorado. Think about that. A girl, 14, 15, 16 years old, can go get an abortion without mom and dad even knowing that that is horrific to me. She doesn't even know what's going on in her body at that age. And then she's going to go through something so traumatic. There's 13 or 14 states right now that have lifted all the restrictions. Colorado was one of the first, and then we've become an abortion destination. There's been a 70% increase in out-of-state abortions. That statistic came from the Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. That's not a focus on the family stat. That's straight from Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. an increase. We've become an abortion destination state. Wow. This, that's such an extreme position on abortion. Abortion for any reason or for no reason up until the moment of birth. It can't be the case that Coloradoans really believe that, is it? I don't think so. In fact, when that was on the ballot, there were over a million voters that said no. Hmm. A million voters, a million people in the state of Colorado that said that's not what we want Colorado to be known for. So what do we do in that situation? Regardless of the law of the land, that's when the big C church steps in. That's when each of us individually say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to come into this conversation? You make abortion unthinkable, and it doesn't matter what the law is, we serve women, we help women, we help men. We want those families to thrive, even if it's a single mama family or a single daddy family. We want them to thrive, but we want them to thrive in Christ, and that's where the church comes mm. in. You mentioned the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Let's go back to that moment, June 2022. The Supreme Court says abortion is not in the Constitution of the United States. This is not a federal decision. Correct. So it didn't ban abortions. Correct. It just said the federal government can't say abortions are permitted mm -hmm. if the state doesn't want that. So they essentially said, we're going to have 50 different approaches to this rather than one. Is it, am I getting that? That is correct. Right? So the wording that Justice Alito put in his statement was the right or the protection of abortion was nowhere in the Constitution. So abortion was not protected. The right to an abortion was not protected in the Constitution. So what happened is now it goes down to the state level. So we have 50 battlegrounds instead of one. And... Well, we celebrate that decision because it shows that there was a, a value in life. Um, Attorney General Fitch from Mississippi was very instrumental in starting that. Mm -hmm. um, you have to give her kudos for being brave and really pushing that forward. But we knew that abortion would become even more volatile of a subject. Um, it can be seen as very political in knowing that it went down to the state level. Uh, we look at that and we look at every single state and we look at the pregnancy centers and other pro-life organizations in the state to say, how can we come alongside you? How can we support you? Especially in those states where abortion is so accessible. Hmm. Let's go back to that day, June, 2022. And you probably know the exact day that that decision came down. Mm -hmm. June 24th. June 24th. You are maybe in your office. You're seeing this result come through. What's going through your mind as somebody who helps these pregnancy mm -hmm. resource centers and that is your life passion. Um, funny enough, I was actually on I-70 driving across Kansas. We were on our way to Topeka, Kansas. Our uh, daughter, one and only daughter, was turning 40. She'll love me saying that on the air. <laughs> um, but she was turning 40, and we were going in to celebrate that with her. And I got the news. And I have to say, it was it was a mixture. I think there was joy, but then there was also, oh, here we go. Because I knew 
it wasn't time necessarily for a victory lap. You certainly, um, there were times that I worshiped the Lord and said, thank you. I didn't think I'd see this in my life. And I remember the day it actually became law and the conversation I had with my mom around that. And then fast forwarding and hearing that, um, I was like, it, it took my breath away because really, honestly, didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. But one of the things that we had talked about at Focus for two years prior to that was, okay, if this happens, and then we started saying, nope, when this happens, is Focus ready? And so we started planning something um, before that decision on how we could really start investing even greater into pregnancy centers. And so it took my breath away, and uh, oh my goodness, we have a lot of work to do. Hmm. You mentioned one of those aspects of that work, that you that you went from a one one battlefield to 50 Mm -hmm. battlefields. Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to hear what has happened because as we're recording this today, that's been a year and a half, Mm -hmm. a year and a half. What has happened in the last year and a half? How has that landscape shifted? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that has been honestly, I think covered up in the media, mainstream media, is the attacks that happened at pregnancy centers across the United States. Mm. Uh, There was a group, a very, um, almost a vigilante type group called Jane's Revenge. Um, They started physically destroying buildings, graffiti, broken windows. Uh, One of our pregnancy centers, Life Choices, right here in Colorado in Fort Collins, a dear friend of mine, Jen, runs that. They were firebombed and it closed the clinic for nine months. Everything that was said during that time was, if abortion's not safe, neither are you. That's terrorist activity. But it was very, very quiet. Mm. And so getting that word out that pregnancy centers, even in, even in the midst of that violence, in the midst of a kind of a scary time, they never backed down. They were still open. Everything that they tried to do. In fact, the one in Fort Collins, they had a mobile unit came in. They were still serving clients. Mm because they're so passionate about what they do. If they're making money off of this, why would they do that? Why would they continue to do that, even in the midst of all this violence? And so I think that has been um, heartbreaking for me, because I don't know that people understand everything that a pregnancy center does, the scope of what they do. And it's for the women. They're not just pro-baby. They're pro-woman. So that has saddened me. One of the things that I'm most concerned about, to be honest with you, is how easy it is to get the abortion pill. Oh, okay. The culture is talking about the culture, the pro-choice culture says two little pills can fix this problem. Mm-hmm. I don't think a preborn baby is a problem. I think it's a blessing. But that narrative has just been far and wide and, and talking about women's rights and you're taking away that woman's right. And so these two little pills will fix that situation. And what concerns me the most, even if I took off my pro-life hat as a woman, I want all of the information when I'm doing something that is going to impact my body that way. There's no supervision of a physician. You can order those pills through the mail. There's no confirmation of pregnancy. And the other side is saying that's healthcare. Where are the women, where are the pro-choice feminist women standing up saying that is not true health care, that is actually harming young women, that is harming women in ways that we can't even imagine. Now she's delivering, miscarrying that baby at home with no one around her, no support. That cannot be empowerment. We can't consider that empowerment. Where's the government? Where's the FDA saying this is the only pill that you can take without a prescription that Mm. ends the life of someone, no oversight by a physician. How is that true health care? And I think women are being harmed in ways that we probably won't know for several years. Is that message getting through? Are women understanding that? Because I certainly haven't heard any of that in the media. I don't know if it's gotten to the point of where women are hearing that or it's being disseminated. Um, I will say one of the partners that Focus has worked with for years and years at ADF, and they have stepped up in such a big way. There's 15 different lawsuits right now against the FDA because they acted against federal regulations when it comes to um, a prescription. We'll call it a prescription. We actually had a small victory. We'll take those along the way. The Fifth Circuit is going to hear that, and they're actually going to talk about whether or not that <clears throat> whether or not the ability to order this through the mail should be rescinded. Hmm. And so praying for that, please have your listeners pray for that. That is a huge victory if we can get that through because it means protection for women. Okay. 
Well, the, so so in a way, now that we're down to 50 different battlegrounds, each state is having to figure out how this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that some states that are pretty reliably conservative states, you would imagine pretty reliably pro-life states, Kansas, Ohio, mm-hmm. others, they've, they've had a strong majority of people agree through at the ballot box to put on into their constitution the securing of the right to abortion. Mm-hmm. I just don't know how to get my mind around that. If you've got all of these people in those states who are pro-life and now they're voting against that, or mm-hmm. is it because they're tricked or is it because they just think, oh no, freedom has got to be the most important thing? Or is it that the, the states are taking the wrong approach? What's what's happening there? Part of it, I think, is lack of knowledge to understand when you when you read one of those bills, it's very overwhelming. They're quite lengthy. Um, and there's wording in there that it kind of misleads, I think, a lot of people to look at that. And it comes back to what's being communicated because of the money. The, yeah. There's a lot of money, you know, in that. Uh, so a lot of money for... Uh, advertising. Mm-hmm. You've uh, got to vote against this. Women's rights are being taken away. And so you create that type of panic in your media campaigns. Well, then, of course, people are going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, what, r- women need to have a right. And so you're tricked into thinking. So that's one of the things we talk about. You know, focus on the family is not the political entity. We're, that's just not who we are. But there's so many organizations that are. And so we have all of that information on our website to say, go there. Here's who you can reach in your state. Call your senators. Call your congressmen, your state representatives. Ask for the bill. Look at that. Really dig in. And I think that's an individual responsibility that we need to accept and look at that to say, wait, 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 wait. I'm not okay with this. Let me look at all the wording. I had a friend one time. uh, She was a state representative here in Colorado, and she said they called it fluff and stuff. So if you stuff something in there, make it fluffy, then it doesn't look like it's harmful. Mm. So I think people are being misled. Okay. Well, and I understand that that it's not the mission of Focus on the Family to get involved in the politics of that. But you mentioned that there are resources available for people who are watching or listening Mm -hmm. who are very concerned. I I think the state of South Dakota has something maybe coming up in this respect. On the ballot, yes. Yes. What are some of the – what's that website for getting those resources? The best one is Paul Batura, who is our – he just leads out so well in this area. And it's the Daily Citizen. It literally is just dailycitizen.com. They will talk about things from both sides, so you get all of the information. Mm -hmm. And it's very bipartisan. So you look at that and you know that it is truth, but it's not slanted either way. And so Daily Citizen is one of the best – resources we have ever had. Okay. So that resource, somebody can go to dailycitizen.com dot com. Mm-hmm. and then, f- and they can read through the articles. And mm-hmm. if they decide they need to do something in their state, then yes. the organizations that would help them support them, mm-hmm. that they could in turn support are all, all this. Absolutely. Listed there. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm speaking to our students at Summit Ministries all of the time ab- about this issue. Or I, or I'm not only speaking about it. Uh, I actually do talk with my students about mm-hmm. the fact that when I was in college, I got my girlfriend an abortion, mm-hmm. and have had to deal with the consequences of that, the emotional consequences of that, mm-hmm. all of my life. I believe that God has forgiven me, but I still feel terrible about hurting uh, a wonderful woman. Mm-hmm. I feel terrible about not stepping up and being a man in that situation. And I I feel bad for my child being destroyed. Mm -hmm. As I look back at that and talk with students about that, uh, I I see that it, it frees them to bring forward a lot of their concerns and their thoughts. And I have had some students who say, I can't tell you how timely this is because mm-hmm. I've gotten my girlfriend pregnant and when I get home from Summit, you know, and that, mm-hmm. that happens. Or they might say, thank you for addressing such a difficult topic. You've given me the courage to address my issue, which is whatever. Mm-hmm. It, so it, it, so we, we talk about this kind of thing all of the time. Scott Klusendorf is here training our students in pro-life. Mm-hmm. But Robin, if, if you're looking at Gen Z 
Now, mm-hmm. these are the young adults we're working with. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it seemed like the millennial generation was moving more toward pro-life. Agreed. Mm-hmm. It seems like Gen Z is moving more toward pro-abortion. At, pro-abortion um, or pro-woman's right to choose? That I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking about it as a generation. Right. So most of the students we're getting here are instinctively committed to protecting life. Many of them see it as a justice issue. Mm-hmm. How, how do we communicate with this rising generation about this issue uh, that counters the narrative, that breaks the false narrative mm-hmm. and allows them to see the truth? I love that question. And that's one of the things that I talk about with our content pro- producers that focus on the family. We can't have a conversation with fists raised. We have to have a conversation with hands out. Can I have a conversation with someone that doesn't include, um, and this is probably going to be controversial. We're going to say it. Um, I don't want to talk about calling a, a, someone who participated in abortion, a murderer. Hmm. I don't like the word murder. I don't like the word kill. Um, I don't like seeing aborted fetal parts in great big, huge posters. I think that immediately shuts out any opportunity to have a conversation. I am not the one who is responsible for changing their mind. I'm the one responsible for telling the story. The Holy Spirit and the Lord works on changing someone's mind from being pro-choice to pro-life. But I think having that opportunity to have an honest conversation, and you know what, sometimes I think it's okay to tell them, you know what? I don't have all the answers, but let me tell you my story. Just like what you've done. You telling that story in a way that is you're still grieving, you still understand the consequences of that, but you're open and you're honest. This generation wants honesty first and foremost. Integrity is huge because like you said, it's a justice issue for them. And then you start talking about it from that perspective of let's just have a dialogue. Can we have a conversation? I don't need you to change your mind right now. Can we have Often can we have conversations even greater than what we're having right now? I think one of the things that I I learned kind of the hard way, um, I had my own unexpected pregnancy. I had my child when I was 16, I had my son, and I never told that story for Mm. a lot of time. It was was shame. It was embarrassment. Mm. So there's still that side of it, even though I chose life. There's still an embarrassment that comes from that. And when I started telling that story, there's a freedom. There's a freedom Mm. that comes. First for me, but it's not about me. It's God's story, and it's His opportunity to use that story to teach someone else um, the value of life. And so just an open conversation, hands out, not fists raised, not voices yelling. I don't think that ever solves a problem. Can we be respectful and have a conversation with someone who disagrees with us? I think so, and I think that's how we start. I know Focus on the Family has ministries to every age level, and I know there's a parenting and teen Mm -hmm. division. Mm -hmm. I assume that it's not just the parenting of teens, but there are actually ministries there that reach out to young adults. Mm -hmm. How how do you all approach this issue? Do you talk to teens about the issue of abortion, and how do you address that? Because Mm -hmm. a lot of people who are watching or listening, they have children at home, and this is a really tough thing for them to figure out how to bring up. Right. Dr. Danny Huerta, who is our vice president of parenting, he and I work together on uh, a little book that we call Value in Life from the Start. So it's age and stage appropriate when you start talking about babies and where do babies come from. And then you get to the teen section, and we're very, very honest with the parents and saying, if you don't have this conversation before it happens, you won't have the conversation when it does happen. Because if you have the conversation beforehand, they're going to feel safe to come to you. Yeah, they know they've messed up, messed up. They know that you've taught them that marriage is, or sex and marriage is, you know, comes hand in hand. But if you've talked about it before a situation happens, even if it's a friend, maybe it's not them, but it's a friend, they're going to feel safe enough to come talk to you because you've started the conversation as mom and dad. Where's your start anyway? And so we've even have conversation starters in that booklet. So if you know, if your teen says this, here's how you respond. And it has to be very open. It has to be very honest. Mm. So we do talk about that. Danny and I have done podcasts on how you talk to teens about abortion. How do you talk to teens about uh, rape and abortion that happens after rape? We've gone into really hard conversations. 
Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear mm-hmm. that, and I'm glad those resources are available. Tell me the name of that booklet again. Valuing Life from the Start, Valuing and it's a free download start. for anyone who wants it. Just go to the Focus website. So it's great conversation starters, and for the littles, there's activities that you can do that starts talking about the value of life comes from who we are in Christ. We don't get to assign that value. It's because of who we are in Christ and made in His image. I, I don't blame anyone else and don't want anyone else to take responsibility for my decision to get an abortion for my girlfriend when I was in college. Mm-hmm. But I definitely remember that I thinking I can't talk to anybody mm-hmm. in my church about this. I can't talk to I can't talk to these people because they somehow believed that if you talk about abortion, if you become pregnant, you know, here mm-hmm. this because they'd be like well, well, don't ever become pregnant because you're never going to have sex until, until you're married. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like they felt this tension of how do we help our young adults stay sexually pure while at the same time talk about the issue of abortion and our support. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, is that a tension that could be resolved? It is a tension. And I think part of it is, you know, it's interesting. You, you have that that insight, um, I think pastors often are afraid to have that conversation because it does feel like if I talk about sex before marriage, am I condoning it? But then if I talk about sex before marriage and there's an abortion that happens, am I condoning that? It's just this weird cycle that Mm -hmm. you go through. And one of the things that a pastor, um, I was actually a pastor at my husband's church. So father of the baby is my husband of 45 years. So we chose life and got married. It'd be 45 years next month. That pastor said, yes, you went outside God's design for marriage, sex before marriage. However, that baby's not the sin. Hmm. Hmm. So think about that. That life, that life is still made in God's image. And so him having that conversation where he said, of course you... I hate saying a mistake because it sounds like you're judging, but of course you went outside again, God's design for marriage. However, this is what we can do. Here are the resources. Can I come alongside you? And it it really started as on a path of finding forgiveness for the decision that we made to have sex before marriage. But then it also honored that the baby and the, and the pregnancy is not a sin. And so I think having pastors who are open to have that type of conversation, even from the pulpit. I've had pastors say, oh, I don't I, I don't want to talk about abortion because I'm so afraid I'm going to hurt someone. I said, you're not hurting them. You talking about it, you become the safe place. Hmm. And so I guarantee you there's someone in your congregation or multiple people who've had that decision in their past. You talking about it, but from a redemptive perspective instead of a judgmental perspective, you now become the safe place. And so young people hear that, they see that, and they know that there's... Uh, opportunity um, for forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. There are opportunities throughout the year for pastors to address the issue of abortion from Mm -hmm. the pulpit. It is true. I'm sure that, uh, I don't know, maybe a third of the people in the congregation, maybe more have participated Mm -hmm. in an abortion decision. Either they've had an abortion, they got an abortion for someone, or they encouraged someone to get an abortion. So they are feeling this very personally. How you talk about it compassionately matters a great deal. Absolutely. But there is a, a, a pro-life Sunday, isn't there, where pastors can naturally bring this up and equip mm-hmm. their congregation? Right. The anniversary of the original Roe versus Wade when it was put into law in 1973 was January 20th. And so it's typically the Sunday after that or the Sunday prior, depending on you know where it falls. Um, and it's Sancti Human Life Sunday, and we encourage pastors to talk about it. We encourage pastors not... Just to limit it, though, to that January Sunday, talk about this Mother's Day. That's a really hard holiday for women and that have had that abortion decision. Um, talk about it Father's Day. Greg Smalley, who is our vice president mm-hmm. of marriage, he also has an abortion story. And he talks about it from a father's perspective, a father's heart, just like what you said. When you talk about this often enough, healing comes from that conversation and healing comes from knowing my church is a safe place, my pastor is a safe place. So don't just stick to Sanctity Sunday. Hmm. 
Great counsel. Robin, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I'm really grateful that you came over to the Summit Ministries headquarters today. and My first time here, and it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I know people can see out the window a little bit through the cameras and how, how pretty it is. That's real. That's not mm-hmm. a fake backdrop. Right. That's actually the real town of Manitou Springs. And we'll be having a lot of students here this summer, uh, thousands of students who will have the opportunity to hear mm-hmm. the biblical narrative about abortion and also Mm -hmm. the facts of how they can talk about it intelligently with their friends and also compassionately. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all the resources that you provided through Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I I, I know we only have another minute or so, but you mentioned that your work also involves foster care and Mm -hmm. adoption. Mm -hmm. And I would just love for you to mention that because I know a lot of families are kind of thinking they might be involved, but they're scared. Oh, absolutely. So what we do is raise awareness of children that are currently in foster care. There's over 400,000 currently in foster care in the United States. Those are huge numbers. Um, There's over 100,000 children who have, um, have, for whatever reason, parental rights have been terminated, no extended family are able to take those children, and they are considered legal orphans in the United States. And so we raise awareness of those children and the need for a forever family, um, similar to what we did with our grandchildren when they were three and four. We went through that process, as painful as it was, learned lots of lessons, um, but wanted them to be in a safe environment. So that's one of the, the hats that I wear. Um, we have an online learning program at waitnomore.com and Wait no more.org. And if you're thinking, your listeners are thinking or praying about what is God calling me to do in that space, that's a perfect place to go to get more information on how do I start, where do I start, yeah. and what is my yes that I can say to the Lord in that space. Maybe He's not calling you to foster or adopt, but there's something that you can do to provide respite care or support for a family that is called to do that. So find out what yeah. God's calling you to do. Robin, you are an inspiration personally and professionally. Thank you for sharing your story Mm -hmm. today. And thank you for sharing about these resources as we seek to create a culture of life, as you mentioned, a culture in which abortion becomes unthinkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank Thank you you. for having me on. And thank you for standing for life and the way you teach students. Um, It's invaluable. So thank you for that. Thank you to my guest, Robin Chambers, for coming on the show. This podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. At Summit, we exist to come alongside the rising generation, their trainers, parents, and influencers, so that young adults may know God's truth and become champions of a biblical worldview. If you're looking for more resources on the pro-life cause, you can, of course, visit focusonthefamily.com. Lots of resources there, as Robin mentioned in the show. You can also visit summit.org slash resources, where we have all sorts of free content available for you. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Dr. Jeff Show podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. Summit equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. If you want more resources that can help you live out a biblical worldview as a student or reach the next generation as an educator, church leader, or parent, head over to summit.org slash resources to find out about the programs, the articles, the videos, the eBooks, and more that we offer. Also, if you're looking for more great podcasts that will build your faith and inspire you, our friends at Edify have what you need. You can find more podcasts, including the Dr. Jeff Show podcast, on the Edify app. Download it at edify.app, spell E-D-I-F-I, and then you can also search for it in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store.